You're listening to the Underscore Transformation Podcast, your practical guide to business transformation. Welcome to the Underscore Transformation Podcast. This is episode 10. My name's Jason West. And I'm Joe Wales. And together we're the founders of Underscore. This week we're talking about solution design. And by solution design, we mean designing new systems, processes, operating models, and team capabilities that are going to deliver your vision, uh, your strategic objectives, and ultimately your business case. But you've got to do this within the constraints of your already agreed design principles. But these solutions have also got to work in the real world. So uh, functional teams and your customers out in the business need to actually buy into these new ways of working and they've got to adopt the change. Uh, They've also got to be trained and willing to um, use these new ways of working. So your program team are going to need to design solutions within these tight constraints. So people who have been successful in managing operations can often find the demands of designing solutions quite challenging. So let's just kind of unpack these different elements that we're going to have to consider uh, as part of our solution design. So where's the best place to start with that, Joe? What should we talk about first when it comes to solution design? Most programs, most most transformation programs will involve changes to people, um, whether it whether it's that operating model, whether it's uh, process, yeah. um, technology f- refreshes nowadays. It's you see you see a lot a lot of transformations programs getting initiated and enabled by technology refreshes. Yeah. So the, these are the, probably the three key things. So it's your people, your process, uh, and your technology. Yeah. Um, what drives technology? Data. So you've got to, to, to be really, really clear about where your data is set, what, what system is mastering what data, especially if you're going to implement a technology uh, over the top of it. So these are the sort of things that you need to start uh, thinking about. Yeah. So start thinking about your data architecture, your system architecture. How, is my, um, how are my processes get, being run today? Hopefully you would have you would have done some some element of benchmarking along the way that will tell you where have you got um, efficiency uh, or effectiveness issues along uh, among some of your processes so you know what problems you're trying to solve at this yeah. stage right so actually that's a good point because mm. when we talk about solution design we've got to, we I think the first thing we should probably say is when to do it yeah and the time to do it is after you've understood where you are today and the problems that you're trying to solve yeah. don't start with designing the solution <laughs> yes. and yeah. definitely don't start with selecting a technology <laughs> yes before yeah. you've really understood uh, the, yeah. the business problems you're so trying to understand, solve yeah. understand the problem capture the requirements and and really be clear about where you are today yeah get that signed off to say yeah the, this is what you need to address and then start thinking about the solution design yeah and you the 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 level of detail that you need to go into is driven by being able to populate a business case with a set of numbers that are um, pretty robust so you can't have too many, you know, wild assumptions about how much, um, how long it's mm. going to take you to deliver this program, um, uh, for, you know, what, 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 yeah, yeah, what, exactly. what technology you're going to procure, what it's going to cost to implement, how, how much process and, and operating model change you've got. So uh, the, the solution design has to be of a sufficient level of detail to uh, build a credible business case and be able to paint a picture that that um, has a sufficient level of credibility in front of the exec to say these are the things we're going to change yeah. and this is our fully costed plan and design. Absolutely, and we've seen we've seen too many examples where where organisations sort of just uh, jump knee deep into a, a set of design, uh, start designing solutions. Yeah. Uh, in in this in this phase, and, and and without having done that adequate level of due diligence around your what business problems we're trying to solve, um, you know, of, of how how our processes are actually working today, how are people organised, yeah. and to just make a set of decisions about a future state without really understanding the two the, the as is. So I think this this in this phase of the program is to help illustrate what the end state will look like. Yeah. Um, there will be some iterations along the way once you get off the ground, once you sign off the business case, you'll get a technology platform in a room 
And at that point, you might have some iterations about what you know about that end state, because ultimately, a lot of these um, uh, processes will be largely determined by how the technology is is able to sort of process those yeah. or, 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 or or manage those processes. Um, I think the area that you really must start with is your target operating model design because that's going to drive pretty much everything else. You, 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 you have so to, So before yeah. you get into process, before you get into systems, really be clear about Who how we're going, going to, to organise, how we're going to deliver services to the business. Mm. So really being clear about, you know, you take your vision, your strategic objectives, your design principles, and you apply them to your future operating model. So if those are the things we need to deliver mm. and this is how we're going to deliver... What does that mean? What are the key elements that are going to make up our target operating model? Mm. Um, what are they going to be accountable and responsible for? And then how does that then break out into the next level of detail? How does how does your business partnering or your you know, centers of expertise or your shared services or whatever those those structures are, um, well, how does that break out into roles? Um, or mm. teams first and then roles and then you can start thinking about processes but you need to be able to articulate at a, at a reasonable level of detail what, what the accountabilities and responsibilities are at a role level. Yes and, um, and in, in, in words um, again we, we, there's this, this idea of racy and I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with what that, what that uh, means you know responsible, accountable, being informed and consulted um, this is this is methodology that's uh, widely used in sort of def defining processes and so on. Um, we tend to focus at this stage of the uh, um, uh, of um, of the program in the scoping phase, really, just on, on the R's and, and the A's, and being very very clear about about who is ultimately accountable for. Um, for a particular process, and when when we talk about process, we're not talking about we're talking about process in this, sometimes the broadest sense, right? So P two P or, or or recruitment or defining or defining your the strategy, strategy for the business, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so these are not sort of transactional processes; these are um, business management processes. So I think the key thing here is that you you've got to tackle this to a sufficient level of detail that it, it informs your business case. You've got to get to some numbers on your target operating mm. model design because you're going from a model today to a model tomorrow, yeah. and they're going to have different structures, different cost profiles. You need to decide geographically where where people are going to be located. You might have an offshoring strategy as part of your operating model. You might be outsourcing. These are all questions that need to be taken into account mm. before you go in front of the exec with a business case because uh, they're going to have a fundamental impact on mm. on how work is going to get done but also what it's going to cost. So the the amount of change within that operating model will then dictate the amount of change that will be required from a systems perspective, a program, a change perspective, but also the processes. Mm. So assuming that you've kind of gone to that level of, of operating model design, um, you need to get to, to that role level before you get to a business case really for the business case to be robust. There's mm. just risk if, if you don't. Yeah, th I mean, there will always be an element of, of, an, of, of an own quantity that you'll need to manage through, through the program once you get it off the, you know, once you get off the gates from, and, and get signed off. Um, but yeah, you, it needs to have, you need to have a really robust story at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, and, and everybody bought into it um, as you sign off the business case that this is the scope of my transformation. It includes making changes to these roles for these reasons because we've done benchmarking, we've done voice of the customer, and we've talked about that in previous episodes. Yeah, um, Our processes don't work because we've got data sets and in different um, core system of records everywhere. Yes. Um, and we can't tell the... There's no one version of the truth to anything, so that sort of gives you the, the rationale to perhaps consolidate um, and streamline some of your technology sets. Um, and of course, we've got the the issues around. Okay, if we want to build, if we want to be a more sophisticated function or a more effective function, we need to create these capabilities among the function that you don't have today. So therefore, this this is the impact on on the, my target operating model. Yeah. And 
because we're going to digitalize and automate a lot more, I won't need as many of these and I need more of these. Yes. So yeah. you, you've got to be able to sort of really articulate all of that clearly and, and, uh, and your business case. And, and if you do that, your, your delivery will become a little bit simpler. People will understand what you're trying to achieve from the very outset. Yes, yeah. And the key thing that it's lined up to your strategic objectives and your vision mm. and, and there's that clean clear line of sight um, because otherwise you know target operating model design can end up actually just being a restructuring right. exercise yeah. and you're putting people's names in boxes and you know it's an org chart mm. uh, and and that that tends to be where where programs really get into trouble um, but let's say you've done your target target operating model design it's kind of been well aligned to strategy uh, you've got your, your numbers and your structures out of it. You then really need to step into process design. But it, it's here that, that there is a difference depending on the technology landscape that, that you're operating in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to um, bring in um, the, the difference between cloud and on-prem, right? I mean, a lot of organizations are moving towards cloud technology. So yeah. there, are very, there are fewer and fewer examples out there where organizations that are, uh, are investing in um, in on on premise solutions, there are still some. Yeah. But a majority uh, are moving towards the, the and, and it's where the vendors solutions. are putting their their investment. Yeah, you know, they're just not developing their on prem products in anything like the sort of way they were previously. They were previously they're, yeah. they're putting a lot of money into cloud. So if you're if you're on a, into an on prem, um, if you're implementing an on prem technology solution, then you have got to to go into the infinite amount of detail. Around how you want your processes to be to be to be executed, because yeah. these are largely uh, on-prem technologies are largely done in sort of not white space, but um, highly customizable to to how you want your processes to be executed. Um, cloud technology is less so. So actually, it's important to describe um, what experience you want. Uh, in your business processes, who's it, who's who's going to initiate? Who's going to approve? Yeah. What's the governance around your business processes? But don't be hung up uh, about designing um, processes at a, at a, a really granular level of detail. Yes. Um, because a lot of these technologies um, won't be able to to deliver against that level of detail because they come pre they, they become preset with their own business processes. Yeah. So there's a concept in in design in your, one of your design principles would be actually if we want to go with cloud technology, I am going to exploit the out of the box functionality as much as possible in with the interest of keeping it simple. Yeah. Um, so it, it is it is important spend time on on de- defining that experience and who is involved in those business processes. What's the governance for around those business processes? But don't be hung up about. In in step A, I'm going to ask individuals to complete these set of data sets. Yes, it, yeah. it, it, just, it just won't work. work like it doesn't that. work yeah. like that. Yeah, you can um, waste a lot of time. You will waste scoping. an awful lot of time um, doing you know ne- negligible work. Really. Yeah. You're listening to the Underscore Transformation Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Underscore, the transformation capability specialists. To find out more, visit underscore hyphen group.com. Yeah, so I think the as we're stepping into the technology space now, I think that mm. there, there's quite a lot of architecture that you, you need to get to grips with. And this is where working really closely with your IT function is, is key because you're, you're one way or the other going to be impacting the core ERP system uh, the the core HR reference system, or yeah. you know, sort of uh, the way that you interact with suppliers. So there's you 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 have to consider any changes in the technology space within the wider enterprise architecture, the wider data architecture, systems architecture, and you're going to be pulling out bits of functionality or you know the very center of it and replacing it with something new potentially, or ma- massively updating what's there. And actually, one of the things that we, we we often come across is if you don't do this well, you'll just encounter problems later later down the line. Yeah. Um, you know, integrations will come out of the woodwork. Systems, they need to be fed with data from whether a finance, a finance system or a people, an HR system. Um, and they, they've been, li- these little systems that have been living in there requiring this data set, they haven't been scoped out. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, these programs are time-bound, right? So the minute you, these... Um, 
new integrations come out of the woodwork, it just creates a, puts a lot of risk on the program and actually challenges you know, challenges on the schedule. So yeah. you've got to spend a lot of time really understanding how does the system that I'm going to plug in fit, fit into the overall sort of enterprise architecture? Uh, yeah. And where's the data? Yes, yes. Start with the data. Where is data mastered today? Yeah. And where what, is it going to be mastered flows? tomorrow? Yeah, yes. where is it flowing? Uh, yeah. you know, how is that going to change? Master data management is so, so important here. Um, in, you know, if you're a multinational business, global business, it becomes it's so, so, you know, even even a small business, actually, it, it doesn't, it, actually, the size of the business probably doesn't really matter. No. Um, it, but if, you've, if you've got different data sets in different systems, um, be, be, yeah, it's something you need to pay attention to. No, no, more importantly, actually, since GDPR has come along, mm. so actually, that in itself has changed the dimension of how, of, of, of people, uh, data in, across different systems. Yes. Um, and uh, and if you don't have control of your people data across different systems, maybe use this as an opportunity to to get your your house in order. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the the other things not to underestimate as you're you're going through this scoping phase is just how many decisions your your team are going to have to make around system design, process design, operating model capability, mm. and are they really prepared for that? Because the, these are no doubt great operational people um, that know how to operate within a set of parameters and they may well have been involved in continuous improvement activities over the years. But what you're asking them to do now is envisage an entire new world as much as you can unencumbered about by what, what happens today. So that's a really... Uh, fundamental shift in the mindset of those individuals and it can be really quite stressful mm, mm. you know you're asking them to go from this operational mindset about you know zero errors or you know, you yeah. know however many errors in a million or whatever yeah. the, the lean and kanban <laughs> world yeah. to we're going to rip everything up and do it completely yeah. differently tomorrow and we're going to need you to imagine another world and they may not have had the experience of many other organisations, and we're going to put them into these positions and go. Actually, you you not you don't just need to make decisions. You need to make decisions really, really quickly mm-hmm. with perhaps imperfect information. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're we're going to. By the way, you have to deliver on the the set of objectives and make sure that people want to use these processes and systems. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a big ask. Yeah, and these individuals will find it difficult at times to see how how, how it can be done in, in any other way. Yeah. Um, so they need a little bit of uh, of inspiration, I guess. Mm. Um, and uh, and actually, I would encourage during this phase of the program for um, for individuals to 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 experience meet meet other organisations, see how yeah. check the art of the possible across um, across how you know how other organisations are managing these things. Yeah. Um, just uh, as a as a way of providing that sort of nugget of inspiration that that will enable them to think differently. Yes. Um, you know, we, we individuals can get a bit hung up about well, it's the way it's the way we do it. It's yeah. the way it's been done for however many years or however many months, whatever. Um, and if, might, might find it a little bit tricky to see something different, and especially actually if the the difference will be enabled through technology that they've not experienced before. Yes. So they're they're a little bit blind to what the capabilities of that technology, what capabilities that technology can bring. So it's important that they become familiar with users of that particular technology. Go and speak to people, yeah. and engage engage with individuals externally. Don't be afraid to do that. It's yeah. fine. So one of the things that we we we've done in the past that that's worked well is you you set your design team some homework. Uh, so before you get into your design sessions, you you yes. say, okay, you need to go and visit with a, a certain number of um, external organisations and talk to them about their procure-to-pay process, their resourcing process, and you give them a structured set of questions to run through, and then they have to come back and present. So mm. before you even start your design sessions, they're reporting back on what they found, what they heard. And, and that that worked pretty it well. It did actually. It has, um, yeah. The other thing that that you know is just a consistently good practice approach is to set up roundtable discussions, get mm. get 
people that have been through transformation that are midway through and you know, get them to share their experiences, a bit of a kind of show and tell. Absolutely. If you're looking to to, to acquire a particular set of you know, technology, whether it's an Oracle, um, SAP or, or Workday, whatever, um, ask those suppliers to provide you a list of individuals that they would recommend get around a table with you. Yeah. You know, yeah, don't don't be afraid of asking the question of, of the suppliers. You know, they, they they'll be more than willing to give you good references. Yes, um, to speak to, um, so you can really tap into the brains and minds of those uh, organisations there yeah. who, who have implemented those technologies before and who have transformed. Yeah. A sidebar note, though, is um, do your own research. Uh, go on yeah. LinkedIn, find companies that ha- you haven't been given as references <laughs> by the technology vendors and talk to them. Yeah. Uh, you know, really kind of do your own research yeah, when it comes yeah. to these references is, is key. Yeah. Um, I think the we, we have talked about the importance of building program management capability within your in-house team that you've seconded onto the program, but I, I think you have to build solution design capability as well. So actually investing some time in training and coaching and development sessions around creative problem solving, around innovation, around design thinking, the, mm. Re- give them some tools um, and yeah. and give them some skills around this stuff, and really taking a customer centric approach to design. You know, co- giving that. Then there's lots of tools out there around yeah, this yeah, stuff, absolutely. and there's some really good, st- you know, good things around value proposition design, and there's workbooks, and there's yeah, lots of things. Yeah. You know, um, where you think through um, different personas and you design different systems processes different user experience for those those personas yeah. i mean at this stage of the, of, of of our of, of our program we're, we're in scoping phase so the, the, the a lot of that come to, will come to, into fruition in the next phase absolutely this is this pr- this is really groundwork work. Yeah. this is really getting the grounding set and if you do this right in this phase of the program the next phase becomes a lot simpler yeah um if your scoping is done well then your program is going to be executed more more successfully. There's a yeah. better chance of it being successful if you do if you do all of our checklist points really really well. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, and and giving individuals the skills and capability at this stage is is vital. Yeah. Get them thinking about designing future state. Get them to think about that at this stage of the program, rather than waiting until we're in the next phase when you've got a system integrator in a room asking you difficult questions about how you want your future state to be. Yes, and you're yeah. unable to articulate that. Yeah, it becomes really problematic. Yeah. Um, so if you if you get that design thinking in this stage, stage of the program, it's a lot lot better. Yeah, and these individuals are going through a change curve themselves. Themselves, yeah. They, and, uh, give them as much time to do that, yes. so they're they're ready, engaged, and effective yeah. by the time you need them to make these decisions. And, and again, if you if you provide them with enough inspiration from from people that have been there and done it, um, if you give them the opportunity to do that, they'll be you know inspired by it and energized by it yeah. to to the point that actually, do you know what the, the world world could be different yes yeah uh, and and they'll be excited by it i think this is a, a, a great opportunity and we've got you know we've we've, we've done a lot of these in, in ourselves haven't we and like you said roundtable discussions task people to go out and speak to to people that have been done that and been there and done it yes is, is is a good technique yeah and i think also bringing in program team members whether that's the program manager or a transformation lead you know functional consultants yeah working on your side of the fence rather yes. than on the the vendor's side of the fence yeah that that kind of can bring that external best practice yeah. and constructive challenge um to the, to really inform your permanent design team mm. but they've got to be ready and receptive for it yeah but i think the final piece just to think about and it, it is perhaps this is more as you're building up your implementation team just after your your business case has been approved is really about the 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 individuals that are making up that team so the personalities of the people how to build a really effective team. team. You know, you you need to think about, you know, collaboration with the team. Have, have you got people that have got active listening skills? Are mm. they resilient? Have they got empathy? These are all things that you're going to need uh, as you get into, mm. in, into implementation. And actually spending some time in properly forming that team and what we found has worked a mm. lot is is actually bringing some some psychometrics into into play and yeah. 
uh, really getting the team to understand the communication styles, the thinking styles uh, of the individuals and how they can best work together. Yeah, and, and just making sure you've got a good balance of, mm. of those with innovative thinking, in, in, in a balance of, of people that, that there's focus on detail, those that are focused, you know, the yellows, reds, yeah. blues, greens, yes. whatever you need. You need a good balance in your team of, of these different characters. And, and uh, we've seen this being done really, really well in, in the scoping phases. You're forming your team. Yeah. There you go. You, 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 the sponsor has visibility of the output of these assessments and, and these psychometrics and, and actually makes a set of decisions about uh, the structure of the program team needs to be differently because it's lacking these types of skill sets. Yeah. And these types of behaviors or these types of characteristics. Yes. Um, yeah. Do it at this stage. Yeah. Because you start to forming it, you know, before you, you hit the ground running, uh, once the business case is off the, you know, signed off and, and, and you're at 180 miles an hour, frankly. This stage is probably 120 miles an hour. <laughs> yes. When you go into the next phase, it's 180 miles an hour and be prepared for that. So if yeah. you do as much groundwork as possible in this stage, you'll be more likely, you're, like, you're more likely to be successful. So really big topic. And, Huge topic. This, you know, yeah. we, we've probably just scratched the surface on this one. Um, but, you know, if we summarize, um, there's some kind of key key things to focus on um, as, as you're really thinking about yeah. your solution design. So start with target operating model design and make sure it's aligned to, to your strategic objectives and your vision and it complies with the design principles. Um, design it down to a level of detail that allows you to, to actually fulfill your business case and cost out what your future mm. operating model is. And then that starts to inform your process design. And the process design, the level of detail will be driven by whether you're going for a cloud technology yes. solution or, or on-prem. And then as we step into technology, start with the data architecture. What's mastered where? Where is it flowing today? How's that going to change in the future? The one thing we didn't mention is any new data sets that we're going to need to create. Mm -hmm. And there will be yeah. new ones if you're putting new technology in because yeah. it has new functionality, new processes available. Um, then look at your system architecture. Work really closely with the enterprise architects in your organization because yeah. this is this is kind of you know sort of really big big forehead thinking mm. stuff that you know you you need those architects to help yeah. you through this yeah um uh, and then preparing uh, the team for this solution design activity make sure they've got the skill set the mindset and the tool set to be effective effective super Fantastic. So that's it for Thank you very episode much. nine. Uh, no, sorry. That's episode it for episode 10. 10. Um, next week uh, is our final uh, point on the checklist. So that's going to be episode 11 and that's business case. Everything has been building up to this point. This is where you're about to ask somebody for a very large amount of money for you to go and uh, uh, busy yourself for the next few years. Yes. So thank you again for tuning in and listening. Um, please remember to like and share. Uh, and we look forward to uh, next week's episode.